I want to encourage us to engage in some uh, local IPE uh, and to punt an advert before before we end the before we land up advertising at the end of the session. Uh, just to bring to your attention that on Wednesday, the 28th of July, we're having a focus day on teaching and learning in the faculty. And what that day involves is four webinars. Uh, you can join one or some or all of them uh, because they're not running uh, in parallel. They're going to be running separately. The first webinar is on loop and curriculum development and the mapping software that we're using in the faculty. The second webinar will be on IPE and it will be much more focused than today. Today we're talking about the concept in general. At the webinar on the 28th of July, we're going to talk about the, the WITS experience and what we've done up until now and what we're hoping to do in the future. The third webinar will be on your teaching portfolio as a living document. So for some of you who have not yet engaged with us and others who have, and the last webinar for the morning will be hosted by CLTD on uh, lecturer appraisals and how it is that you can have your lecturing evaluated. We'll then move on to the afternoon session where people are invited to share their own research and their own projects. Um, and we'll also have a keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker will be, for those of you who did not attend SAHI, um, Ayelet Cooper from the Wilson Centre in Toronto, and she's speaking on health professions education as a vehicle for social justice. She's, uh, I don't know if Mantua's on the call yet, she's Mantua's, one of Mantua's supervisors, and we've had some really interesting chats with her about her work, um, also in the South African context. So we're very excited to be able to share that. She did speak at SAHI, but we felt that since there were few VITSEs there, it would be really nice on our focus day to share that experience with everyone. Uh, so uh, if I just, I will drop into the chat when I eventually get to the chat, um, the the URL just to click and register. You can attend some or all or whatever you feel like of the day uh, and you can drop in and out as well. So please uh, advertise for us and tell your colleagues about it. And we're very happy to have as many people as possible because it's going to be entirely online. So people can join from their phones or they can join from work or they can join from wherever they are, which I'm hoping will be a, a positive experience for the teaching and learning fraternity in the faculty. OK, let's let's look at IPE and, and why I say IPE is because those sorts of sharing days become IPE events in and of themselves. So it's it's quite a useful thing if we want to have a look at how people do interleave and dovetail while they're busy sharing their teaching innovations. The article that I selected today was from MedEd Publish, and the reason I chose it was because that's a platform that not many people really consider. On the negative side, it's not ISI approved, and therefore you won't get money for publishing in MedEd Publish, um, although they do now have a, a new hosting for the site. However, it's a really nice place to share teaching and learning ideas because you get lots of feedback. The structure of the platform, and you can see it's hosted by Amy, the International Medical Association, is that uh, people read and then comment on your work and you can choose to either engage with comments or not, it's up to you. But you get a lot more feedback on your work when you've published here than sometimes even when you've published in a mainstream journal. So it's well worth having a look at if particularly you're in the beginning of a project and you want to share your ideas. The article that I chose to talk about today is a 12 tips article, which is very much a review style article. So it's not individual research. Oh, Abby, you're a honey, thank you. Um, it's not individual research, but it gives us, I think, something to hang our hats on when we're looking at IPE in our context, which was the brief of today. No, so um, Dr. Liz, the journal is not accredited and that's why I'm saying you won't get rink money for it, but it's a really good place if you're wanting to publish research that you're looking for feedback on. Okay, so I am going to ask you to engage with either another, another device or just open a tab on your current device and um, 
Janice, I want to know if my screen is still being shared with the slide or if you can now see something uh, else. Yeah, so we see tip one, start networking. Okay, no, that's not where I want to be. Let me see if I can unshare it and then share something else. Let's go. Um, hmm. So interesting that it looks at uh, there we go. Let's share this window with you. All right. So if you could please go on to maybe open another tab on your browser and log into this URL at the top, pollev.com forward slash shiramach one word with two R's. 652. And you'll see the question. I'm really interested to know what professions you have currently contact with in your environment. And I'm looking for any professions. And if the professions have two words in their name, please just hyphenate them. So who do you work with in your current environment? I'm interested to see what range that we're currently working with. So far, no one's managed to log in. There we go. <laughs> yes. Doctors and nurses, that's true. In most of our hospital environments, we do have those. Yes, thank you for remembering the hyphen. Lovely. Arts therapy. Is that part of occupational therapy? Clinical associates, biokineticists, administrators. Yes, part of the team. Anybody work with anybody else? There we go. OT made it on the list. <laughs> All right. I see you're engaging well with the, the concept. I want to know if it's one person who put in health seven times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Phlebotomists, particularly or in general. <laughs> Geneticists. NMFC as a group. Wow, we did score dentistry. That's great. Uh, what was family attached to? Family as in part of the uh, patients' families and systems that work in, or was that just health systems or all systems? Workers, clerks, physicians. Okay, so that is indeed a, an interesting uh, group of people that we work with. And I, I, I do think that it's, it's interesting if we start looking at the people around us, because in general, as you saw, it's quite easy to say uh, doctor or nurse. Um, but if we start thinking about it, if we start looking at who's around, um, it makes it easier, I think to to see ways in which we can start helping people to work together. Okay, let's resume from where we were. So start networking. That's their first tip. Their first tip is look around and see who's there and think about who it is you can involve 
in helping students step out of their own silo. Um, I noticed we didn't have people like ward cleaners on your list. And I think it's part of us really realizing that we are a community of practice of healthcare workers, that everybody can be a master in their own area. So, um, yeah, Matty, interesting. Different, different ways of looking at therapy. And also it shows to some extent our ignorance of other people's practices um, and other people's scope of practice and not the obvious things. So even looking at who is in the ward associated with what our students do as part of their scope of practice, it helps us to, to focus on the fact that there are actually other people there and we should start speaking to them. The article moves on then, once you've realized that there are other people around you, to look at things which seem like the same thing, but actually aren't. So tip two says, pick a topic that different professionals engage in together in the real world, and then focus on a topical or relevant issue, and then look for natural IPE topics in curricula. And that is, Although it sounds like we are um, working on the same thing, it doesn't necessarily actually mean that. Um, so let's look at our next poll. And that would be, I'm interested for you to please uh, refresh your screen because you will have the old poll on it up until now. So refresh your screen and start giving me some topics. Let's pick a topic that professionals would engage in together in the real world. So the classic one for me, having an interest in pharmacology would be pain management. You know, um, almost every single profession has their approach to pain management and, and how they would help a, a patient who was in pain, whether it was acute or chronic, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a topic that is a real world topic, but that um, all of our professionals in their own sphere would have to engage in. So let's see just off the top of our heads if we can come up with things where, where people would have to engage together. Yes, wow, huge, broad, broad areas, ethics and rehab. So yes, you've learned, you can rank them. <laughs> this is what's called a brainstorming activity. Yeah, lovely. Diabetes has something for everyone. <laughs> or lots of chronic conditions. As a general rule, yes, patient education or patient counselling, some people call it. Let's see if we can get to eight, guys. <laughs> I like that. Persuasion and debate implies you actually have to know how to build an argument, though, and you also have to learn to listen to the argument. And yes, from our perspective teaching, and maybe from students' perspectives learning, which I guess we all agree is something different from teaching. Yeah, health promotion, I put in the same uh, category as patient education, perhaps. End of life care, great. Who's going to start choosing what they feel is top, what they feel is, wow, love this. Psychiatry and psychology, schizophrenia, so definitely something for everybody there. Chronic disability. <laughs> So I'm interested to see. Yeah, okay, resource seeking. That's a really, really useful one because lots of people, I mean, every single discipline has to work on that. This is fun, guys. I hope you're telling the truth about your tops and your bottoms. <laughs> I'm interested that, that the program didn't filter out ethics twice. But OK. Right, so 
So let me lock you there. And say that it's interesting that um, we, we tend to think that we have to design an interprofessional activity, that it actually has to be something new and, um, I wouldn't say different, but constructed. Whereas um, if we look at our current practice and if we look at that actually huge list, we can see that there are already plenty of activities where people do work together and where people could work together and be encouraged to work together forward or further. So, so pick a topic that different professionals engage in together in the real world is something that, that we should be thinking about all the time. And when a topic like that comes up, it's really a, a, a teachable moment to be able to say, how would a dentist handle this? Or how would an occupational therapist handle this? Or, or, or um, and bring up some different points of view from the scope of practice that you're currently dealing with, if that is your aim, to help students think interprofessionally. To unpack the difference between the others, um, just in my experience, relevant issues really become teachable moments. So things that are big in the current sphere. So for example, teaching um, all of our students how to vaccinate, how to give a vaccination. Uh, every single one of the healthcare professionals should be able to do that to some degree. Uh, or um, how to put on PPE, and even more important, how to take off your PPE. Uh, those are things that students really need to know, um, and it's something that, that we could speak about in a broader context than just with our own students. And then things like natural IPE topics in a curriculum. Uh, they're talking about learned skills, say, within the community of practice. In the article, the natural topic that they bring up is uh, handover skills. Uh, that most curricula do not have an actual learning activity involving handover, and yet every single profession at some point has to hand over a patient. Uh, whether to each other or whether within the silo, it's still a skill that, that we need to work on. And so the idea that, that all these three are things that are where we need to be sensitized to picking up what we do in our current environment and where we could encourage intersectorial learning, if you like. I like tip number five because it's something that we've come across fairly often. When you are artificially constructing an interprofessional event, and we'll talk a little bit about how all of those constructs uh, can be designed in a curriculum, if you try and include absolutely every single profession, including the legal clinic and the social workers and the audiologists and the everybody, uh, you land up with a uh, less than simulated patient. You land up with an unbelievable patient. So there has to be an, an element of credibility in the patients or the cases that you're working with when you're trying to build an interprofessional event. And that credibility is held up by how, patient, how students can engage with that patient management. So interprofessional events are great, but including absolutely everybody makes it really difficult for students to be able to buy in. And so we need to, I think, be a little bit careful about how we design our events. And that's one of the reasons why in our faculty we have moved away from the grand uh, big bang events that we used to have where we had 800 students together on a day, and we try and include activities where everybody would do something. Um, it's not always viable within their own profession. So worthwhile thinking about. Okay. Tip number six for me is uh, a really interesting one, and that is how are we gonna define our RPE? Um, and so, how do we know that it's IPE and not just shared learning? And so please refresh your screen again in your tab. And share with all of us, what are your experiences of shared learning? And now I'm looking for shared learning, not uh, an integrated interprofessional educational event. So in your experience, where have you 
experienced shared learning or taught shared learning. It is open-ended, so you can type as much as you like and you don't have to hyphenate. <laughs> Just go for it. Perhaps it's more common in the basic sciences. So I could say my experiences is where we've had dentists, nurses and physiotherapists in the same pharmacology class. Okay, so they're all sitting there in the same class and each one has a different exam and a different expectation of what they would learn. Yeah, okay. It is useful to expect community healthcare workers to share their experiences with everyone because they're the ones at the point of contact quite often. Who else do we teach together? Yes, I like that. Educational events and like in the Safri Fellowship, we all learn from each other. Yay. I know who wrote that, <laughs> but that is absolutely true. Um, in all the events that you have together, learning events, reading groups, so writing groups, field trips, and in the postgrad diploma, for example, classroom, where we have a whole bunch of people learning together. Yes. Now, let me get a little bit technical then. If we've got BCMP and GMP students reviewing charts together, why is that not interprofessional learning? Why are we calling that shared learning? Why would we? Anyone can just open their mic and have a chat. Now you're all scared of me, right? <laughs> if, if, hi, hi, sure. Yes, go ahead, so you. Um, I think the problem is often that you can teach them together, but you don't actually reflect on practice together and how the sort of issue is dealing with mean, perhaps clinical associates and GAM3, GAM4 students kind of practices very similar. But I think that there are situations where we don't actually ask how the two interact with each other in practice. That's my thought so about, like the, yeah, you know, absolutely. Professional. So we have groups of students in the same learning event, but we're not asking them to interact in any kind of interprofessional way. Uh, or to learn with each other or from each other. And, and I think that that's what they mean, that it's not merely shared learning. They're not uh, in the same classroom together, and we're calling that into professional learning. So I think we're on the same page with that. Um, yeah. Exactly. I think it is, it's something that we have to be aware of. Uh, and particularly if we're trying to map it in our curriculum, to say that students are in the same room with other students does not make that an IPE event. And that leads to what are our objectives? How is it that we want these students to experience their interprofessionality, as it were? Okay, so I think that it's important to, to now look at the technical aspects because why I chose this 12 tips article was related especially to, um, yes, affordances, how do we organize such a thing, but also what are the constraints? So whenever anybody wants to look up to, to set up some kind of an interprofessional program, and we have done it several times over the years, new programs, new ideas, less, let's get going. Um, the first thing that people are, are concerned about is how much time we can give it. 
Uh, so what time is needed to work interprofessionally? What time is needed to um, insert things into a really already overstuffed curriculum? And how do we uh, make sure that students have an experience? Should we start in first year, for example? And the problem with that is most students don't really resonate with the profession that they're uh, going to learn about when they're in first year because they don't know the scope of practice and they don't often know what those professionals do. So is that a good place to, to introduce it? What about final years? Final years are also worried about final exams and is there time for them to have an event which is perhaps uh, non-credit bearing or should it be credit bearing? So all of those practical kinds of questions of when do we squeeze this in and how do we make it work are, are things that um, hold back people from launching IPE programs. How we got around it um, in our circumstance in the development of the new event when we gave up on the 800 student strong events was to say wherever students are in their clinical training we should do that first exercise, look around and see who else is there, and then try and introduce an activity that allows students to work together where the objective would be that they learn from each other and with each other. So I'm sorry I've ever had to leave the, the call because she's got a great example of the GMP4 students um, when they go on their um, what do you call it, your IPC block, uh, and, and where they have to engage with other students who are there uh, and complete a, a workbook of activities that we have, which helps them to be sensitised to who's out there. Tip number eight in the article is something that I absolutely don't agree with. So let's have some discussion about that. I'm prepared to, to listen to what people have to say. Their uh, point is, offer it as an optional extra to begin with. And in fact, that's how it started out in terms of our planning. When we first looked at an IPE program in 2015, we went around to quite a few other universities to see what they were doing. And in a lot of universities, it was an optional extra. So you could join an IPE team, say, every Wednesday afternoon as part of your clinical rotation, and they constituted the teams, uh, maybe 20% of the program did it, and those students had a really quality and interesting experience. The problem with that is, I think in our South African context is, that you land up then with some students who have an experience and other students who don't because they don't have the time or because they don't have the um, ability to travel to a certain place or because um, they don't have the time in their curriculum because they're busy with other things. And so if you make it optional, then some students will be advantaged over others in that they do have this wonderful experience. And in fact, some of the students were saying it helped them to, for example, get a job or it helped with some application or other. Um, that it showed that they'd taken initiative and done something extra and done well at it. So one of the ideas that we wanted when we started our program was that actually it would be an experience that everybody shared. I'm happy to take some conversation about that. So anybody who feels like it probably would have been less daunting if we started as an optional extra with the number of students that we have in the, our faculty, Bearing in mind that not all faculties have, we have nine professional degrees and uh, a science program as well in our faculty, a health science program, um, compared to other faculties where they don't have as many programs. And we could look outside the faculty too. That's the one thing we didn't do, was include the other faculties in the university who could be part of the IP project to start off with. Um, I think we, we did have some constraints. <laughs> So ideas, do, do you think that that it's an, a decision that should be revisited? Should we make it optional? And should we tailor it once once we make it optional and makes it much easier to, to deal with the numbers of students? You can answer in the chat if you like, Stuart. Happy to take your opinion. Uh, so I just feel like the, the potential benefit for the patients, for all of our graduates to 
uh, be adept at, at working with other professions and providing interprofessional care just means that I think every student should really know what the other professions have to offer and how that could benefit their patients. So this is not something I think should be optional, but rather something that's core uh, with the end goal in mind of making sure our patients are getting the best possible care. Yes, I like that. And, and setting the objective of what it is we want the students to achieve in this interprofessional work. Kath, your turn next. Thank you. I wanted to ask um, as a sort of side issue, what happened to the excellent student led organization that popped up, I think about 2015? Um, maybe it was a year later, but I feel it was 2015, which was an interprofessional student led group. And they were running very interesting sessions and bringing in speakers and trying to get the mood going on the entire health science campus that it was really cutting edge and cool and not a drag to be highly aware of um, the spaces between the synapses. And they even came up, I think, with a beautiful Sutu word for synapses and connections. And they wanted to feed off the energy of academics who were also spearheading this and clinicians. And I just wondered if that petered out, if it was supported, if it drifted away when that group of students graduated and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, essentially, my understanding of it was exactly as you've ended, that the group of students who were most committed and involved graduated and left the um, student arena, and hopefully they're now in the professional arena pushing the same agenda. Uh, we had two distinct programs. So the first one was launched in 2016, and yes, had that flavor of, of um, student involvement, student driven involvement, as well as the faculty planning. Uh, and those we called our Big Bang Days. The choice was which classes did we include? So were they final year students? Were they penultimate year students, et cetera? And what did we do with them? Uh, and we scheduled three full days in the entire year curriculum where those students got together and cycled through a, a series of activities. Um, some people loved it, some people hated it, um, some students felt they really learned from it, other students <laughs> didn't enjoy it. So, so there was real pros and cons for that program. And then in 2019, we got together with um, Glenda Oyang in terms of her um, human systems dynamics uh, to look at designing an IPE program that would be embedded within the curriculum at FITS. Um, starting off in the health science faculty and then maybe moving further afield. And again, we did involve students in that um, and we had some really cool student feedback. It's really interesting to understand what students see in terms of what other professions do and how it is they can intercalate. And you'll see when we get to, I think it's tip number 11, <laughs> we'll get to it, is where they say we need to make space for students outside of the actual IPA activity to collaborate with each other and to, um, to cement the learning that they actually have. So I agree with you, Catherine, that we need to really, really encourage the students to be involved, but we also need to support involvement across all the years of the programs. So at the moment, our initiative started with students who are already in the wards or um, in patient care environments because they're already doing that as part of their practice. But there was a huge discussion about incorporating these high impact practices, one of which is an interprofessional touch, uh, starting from first year. So I think we're working top down and bottom up with regard to students and hoping that they will start to develop this idea that even though they're learning a specific professional set of skills, that they can um, they can develop uh, links across all of their professions and make friends, yeah, and and celebrate those friends across the the um, divide. I also say that when we do specific activities, like for example, when um, pharmacy students went on ward rounds with doctors specifically with medical students. Um, 
in a more sustained manner, like they went on 10 rounds together, for example, they started um, calling each other, you know, my pharmacy student said this and that, or my medical student showed me this and that. So it's quite interesting in their feedback that they start taking some ownership of the program. So there we go. Um, Abby, do you want to tell us about the society? Uh, uh, Kath, you want to come back in again? Let Abby go and then I'll come back in if that's okay. Great. Um, I just posted the name, Kath, if you, want, you wanted to um, remember that. It was the Komanani Interprofessional Society. And I know that the, the chairperson of the society was doing her OT placement last time I heard. Um, I'm not quite sure with COVID whether they've had any active meetings. But I know that they also put in a abstract for a co conference that was cancelled last year due to COVID. Um, so I think that they're still active. They're just probably not um, physically around. Um, great. Thank you for that. Can I come in here, Shira, just with one one last thought? Which yes, was this Yes, just it was just this question um, that came up last year in the Pandemic Pangolin series. One of the most exuberant outbursts from students was joining the sessions where groups like MSF and Gift of the Givers, where their leadership was speaking. And the students that came in, who were across the board, all the way from first year students up to about to graduate in different um, disciplines and with degrees, they commented on how exhilarated they were with the way in which teamwork was visible in those entities. And it seemed to really spur discussions amongst young people about the way in which interprofessional teamwork um, was a way of kind of breaking through some of the lock jams and some of the almost like disappearing holes of energy that can happen in institutions that are very large and all or, or that are very complex and i just thought that's sort of a theme that becomes very visible in a pandemic and it might be um something that could be hinted at as a kind of dimension that would be in an optional uh, sort of parallel curriculum that's useful because, it, again, if we make it optional as part of curriculum, that's an issue. But if we have optional, optional things, it might be really exciting for students. Stephen, you want to come in here? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shira. Um, and uh, I'm actually just thinking back to the point that you, that you made for the previous tip about when it's a, the best time to actually bring in this type of learning, whether you do it earlier on or later when those professional identities are more formed um, and this is a this is something that um, I've heard come out from our students in the Bachelor of Health Sciences where they feel like a kind of a floating uh, discipline if you like or a floating identity within the faculty um, where because they don't belong to so, so to a very defined profession and they often feel sidelined in relation to particularly to the to the medical students who they share a lot of their learning with in their early years. Um, and, and it's a perception um, that comes out from through their experiences of learning and teaching um, in those shared spaces. Um, and uh, in some ways, I feel like by bringing this in early, there's an opportunity to kind of break down those those professional, not break down professional identities, but um, to to create an, a kind of an even playing field where pe people are seen as um, as equivalently important um, toward in, in achieving uh, their, an ultimate goal, which would you know be be towards the wellness of a, of the patient at the end of the day. Um, but our health science students, I guess, uh, or particularly our health system students, um, in some ways, their role would maybe not be so much towards supporting the outcomes of the patient, but actually towards supporting the outcomes of, of the different professions themselves. Um, and I, I, when I looked at the, the article and all the tips and like, and when to limit how many people you bring in, that like you can't have too many people or too many of one group of people in, you know, it's a point of consideration. Would it be appropriate to have 
students such as our health system science students um, who are non-clinical, who don't belong to a defined profession and don't have to register with a professional body, um, would this be appropriate for them to be part of that kind of team collaboration where we where what we've been trying to teach as so central to our to our program is the value of teamwork and how their their um, role could be in supporting the professions to do what they need to do. Um, so yeah, those are just this that's just what's running through my mind at the moment. Mm, some lovely thoughts. I mean, we, we have had some of these discussions with Nabila in terms of how do we integrate uh, the non-clinical students into programs that that most of the literature just speaks of as, uh, I wouldn't say excessively clinical, but where that's the easiest low-hanging fruit to gain in terms of students participating in learning together, not just sharing a space for learning. And I think there's immense value because we're not only looking to improve the health of patients, but we're looking to improve the health system in the country um, and delivery of health care. And I think those students have, have absolute um, uh, buy-in to that idea. And I also think that, that they breaking down the silos and the hierarchies is an important thing. So if you learn as a student that everybody does their job and does it well, whatever that job lands up being, then you're a more balanced healthcare professional than if you say, let me just lead this team because I know best what's going to happen. So, so I think that there's space for us to be really imaginative uh, with all of our students in developing their ideas of um, not only the 21st century skills, which you guys all learnt about, you know, teamwork and collaboration and um, effective communication, those kinds of things, but also in terms of um, giving credence to uh, or understanding the scope of practice of, of other professionals and, and what a health systems specialist could bring to an environment where things aren't going as well as they could. So I definitely think there's space for them and they're part of our faculty. And I do think that we need to be um, quite um, active in deciding how it is that we move forward with our activities. But worried about time. So I'm going to move on one more. Uh, oh, it doesn't help that I'm in the wrong. There we go. So, so Catherine, I come back to your point, which is uh, something that the students made very clear when we had focus groups with them when Glenda was with us um, to start brainstorming what they thought would be good and also uh, to get some feedback on the programs we'd already run. Uh, tip number nine says, enable students to discuss and evaluate with each other outside of the activities. So it's really interesting that, that the, there's a huge social component to not only making sure that students understand that they're learning or um, uh, contributing from their own professions in an actual activity, but that there's space outside of that for them to mix as well. Uh, so they can share phone numbers. And in fact, what we had in the one cohort who had had um, ward rounds together, when those students were interns and then community service practitioners, they had each other's numbers. And it was interesting to see the number of calls that went backwards and forwards and then landed up with staff as well saying, I'm stuck out here and these are the things that I've got in my drugs cabinet and, and what should I give for, etc. So the idea that you can formulate those links and friendships early on and that they can actually extend into the healthcare system, I think is very, very practical. Okay, and I nearly did the whole journal club on tip number 10 which is, they say, manage professional identities appropriately. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do have to say that um, all the logistics up until this point, should it be first year, should it be fourth year, should they be clinical students, who can we include, how long should they have in the curriculum, um, all of those technical things. When do all of our students coincide in one clinic, can we look at, at areas where these overlaps happen, um, all of them are not the reasons why there are barriers to interprofessional work. I think that one of the biggest things that we have to deal with is this idea that 
um, students develop fledgling professional identities, but those identities are modeled by their um, teachers, facilitators, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the person leading the ward round or the person leading the activity is the person who sets the flavor. So we need to make sure that students understand that they actually, uh, medical students can learn from uh, physiotherapy facilitators and um, medical facilitators can learn that when there are students in a group that are not of their own profession, that they can extend the group towards learning things that those other students do actually know. Um, and how students are handled in a group by their facilitators speaks to developing professional identity, but also modeling how you would incorporate other healthcare practitioners into patient care. So uh, my personal feeling is that uh, if we want RPE to succeed in any uh, arena within our faculty and actually further outside of there, uh, we need to spend a lot of time on staff development and staff attitudes and how it is that, that people can deal with multiple sets of students inside of one activity, whether it's patient-based, whether it's tutorial-based, whether it's paper-based or computer-based, all of those things um, are dependent on students' buy-in of how they are actually modeled. So, so I think that managing professional identities is an important thing. And also there's a knock-on in terms of understanding your scope of practice. So we nearly had a, a nurse and a pharmacy student come to blows about who should control a drugs cabinet in a ward. <laughs> And I didn't like the use of the word control in any event, but but the idea of whose responsibility was it uh, in terms of signing certain things off and what can be done and what should be done and where scopes of practice overlap, which they all do actually in some spaces, how you manage that overlap. I think those are, are really important questions for IPE learning. Okay. <laughs> All right, I see we're, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm very happy to take discussion on that point. But it's something that, that I kind of feel quite strongly about, is that we can plan on paper as much as we like, but we're dealing with people, we're dealing with personalities, and we're dealing with professional identities. And those are things that we don't need to break down, but we actually need to manage appropriately. Very nicely worded article, thank you. <laughs> Speaks to also what resources we have. So resources, equipment, etc. Elizabeth, you want to say something about that? Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Shira. I'm taking you a little bit back on the issue of identity. Um, That's great. I don't know how this could be addressed because I've had, I think, for two different years where I spoke to first year nursing students and I've heard this phrase to say I am a medical school reject. So I don't know when it comes wow. to <laughs> Go ahead. That's, that that's how they consider themselves, especially the, 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 the nursing students. They, they, they label themselves as medical school rejects. So I don't know in their in their spaces, especially the clinical spaces where they are now supposed to work together with other groups how that affect their work and their, their interrelationships. So, so I think nursing students are not the only ones who feel that. Um, and I think this is historical and it's current. I think that in our faculty, because the medical program is by far the biggest, uh, and because of the hierarchical structure of our hospitals, um, other students in other programs uh, may feel uh, second class, absolutely, and that's if that's not even a, a way of talking about it. Uh, I think that that there is a hierarchy amongst the students uh, for many reasons, not just because of what they learn, but um, maybe the resources of the programs and the size of the programs, etc. Uh, having said that, because it's so hard to get into other programs like physiotherapy and OT, um, so that leads at least to some degree that, that students feel uh, justified in being in their programs. I've heard dental students say, 
we learn way more than medical students and our degree is far harder than theirs. I've heard clinical associate students say, we learn in three years what medical students learn in six years and we're way better at it than they are. <laughs> so showing you that, that students feel a hierarchy, but also don't properly appreciate what it is that other um, professions have as part of their scope of practice is one of the reasons why I think an IPE program is absolutely not negotiable. I think it's essential um, how students speak about each other and uh, about their own profession, I think is part of what they learn from us. And, and I do think that you're right. I think we have to be very mindful of how it is that we approach our students. And that speaks to, to um, how we, we integrate IPE programs, because integrating a program where students are going to be told, and one of the very first programs I ever attended was where our pharmacy students did join medical students on a ward round. So they joined the other students. And the consultant in the ward said, who are all these other students? And they said, no, they're pharmacy students coming to observe. So he said, fine, medical students come forward, pharmacy students stand at the back and let's run whatever it was they were going to do. And, and it was it was very hard for those students. They, they really felt marginalized, sidelined, um, uh, not included. And, and I think that, that how we handle this is hopefully how the health systems in the future will handle it. That, that we realize that everybody has their place and they do have to um, play that role. So I'm not saying that that all um, facilitators out there do that. There are many, many people who are very inclusive and they do a really good job. But it's the one that makes you feel bad that you remember, unfortunately. So for students, we kind of need to work on, on um, what it is that they feel they can contribute to a discussion. Okay. Um, I'm reading your, your chat, Aviwe. Yeah. Tip 10 is, I think, where it's all at at the moment. Build the culture of unity. I like that. And yes, confront boundaries um, and rigid territories because, because those are artificially set. And if we're looking at bettering the health of the nation, <laughs> never mind an individual patient, uh, we need to challenge those. We really do. <laughs> yeah okay there, there, so yes there are lots of ways of approaching it and I think that that we need to as I've said before we need to be brave in thinking look how much support you're getting Prof Cook that's uh, it's a good suggestion we did speak about resources and you do have to put resources into any kind of program you're going to run um, and their tip number 12 speaks to resources in a way and that sees any opportunity for support um, to make us feel like we uh, like the program counts in a way, I think we we have to show that um, what we're putting together makes it something useful. I'm going to ask you to refresh your screens one last time and and give me some opinion, and that is. What do you think is holding us back in our faculty? What do you think is the biggest constraint to um, interprofessional, I said education, interprofessional learning, students working interprofessionally? What do you think is holding us back? Remember to refresh your screen if you don't see the question. Yeah, okay. So, so that implies, if we're looking at time, that that IPE is something extraneous to the curriculum. Yes, so there we go. Letting go of a traditional curriculum. Community isolation as in isolation of where we work. Yes, different timetables. So it means we have to rise above all of this. And formalized really, yes, makes it mean that it's not an add on, that it is absolutely intrinsically part of what we do. And I'm with you. 
uh, that that the professional domains are threatened if we break down those barriers or if we challenge the barriers. And yes, culture of the faculty, particularly, is something that, that we can continuously challenge. Facilitate understanding, which means faculty development. We need people to really buy in, and that's part of educator buy-in. <laughs> I like that. Institutional architecture, that's structure. Anybody read Margaret Archer? Structure and culture and agency, that's what it's all about. Yes. I like that. So we're talking about a lack of balance. And also, where do we learn and where do we work? So is service not service teaching or service training? And when students come into a service environment, do they understand that they're still learning? And yeah, OK, let's start developing a change management philosophy. Guys, this for me is, is uh, the holy grail. Uh, I like what you're saying. So I can, I can put them out for you and I can share with you what it is that, uh, that you've said. But at this stage, I'm going to leave off showing you the screen. And I'm going to have to say that uh, if anybody wants to add, the reason I chose the article was because it was so broad reaching. And as I said, you will have an opportunity to talk about our specific program and how it developed uh, on Wednesday, the 28th of July. Uh, but until then, uh, any comments on the article? Anything you'd like to say in terms of of the advice that they gave us. OK, I think people have had their say and Yanis, I've reached five o'clock, so I'm going to stop talking because I don't want to be the one that holds you back. <laughs> so thanks very much, everybody. It was really great to see you. Yanis, do you want to tell us what's next up next week? Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, so next week is the um, the second session on um, um, IPE, um, and it's a, um, a tech a, a tech Tuesday. Um, but I'll send out the details during the week um, for the next session. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening in, everybody. See you again. Bye. Thanks, Shira. Thanks, everyone. Bye.